Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining um, our Young Leaf Lay Boys Racial Diversity and Oppression Then and Now event. Um, thanks so much for everyone for um, registering. We've had such a great um, response to both of the events and we're really looking forward to the discussion today. Um, we have an amazing panel which I'm going to be introducing. Um, I'm Hafsa Hussain, I'm one of the Young Leaf Lay Boys committee members and I'm chairing the event with Moni, uh, who is the reporter from the Law Society Gazette. And she will also be chairing as we, and we sort of be splitting the event into two halves, um, just to sort of introduce the context of uh, the event and kind of why we wanted to have the discussion in the format that we've chosen, um, is that in the, the current context, um, in, in, particularly with it being Black History Month and in the wake of the death of George Floyd in the United States, and um, also the Black Lives Matter protests that have sprung up across the summer, um, and it has highlighted the way that Black people are treated at the hands of the police and also highlighted the way that they are treated in the justice system as well. And also uh, we began to see stories emerging from the other side where lawyers themselves um, were unfairly uh, treated, in, particularly in the courtroom. Many of you have heard uh, the stories and the articles that have arisen for um, people being mistaken as defendants and um, that can underpinning the reasons why we wanted to bring um, such an esteemed panel together tonight to have these conversations. And also the kind of underlying context is that from these discussions, we'll be putting forward recommendations um, to stakeholders in the justice system, for example, the Criminal Bar Association and uh, the Courts and Tribunal Service, as well as other regulators with recommendations, hopefully stemming from the discussions in this um, event and also particularly the discussion um, after towards the end. And we would also welcome comments and questions from the audience as well. I'll probably be looking at these um, in the last uh, 20 minutes or so, but um, at a fitting time, I will kind of jump in with them if it relates to um, a particular speaker's experience. Um, so that's just a little bit of a brief introduction to the, the format. I'm going to introduce the speakers. And um, in the first sort of 40 minutes or so, each speaker will share um, some reflections for about five minutes or so, and then around 7.20-ish, um, we're opening the discussion to make it a bit more informal and also inviting the panelists to ask each other questions as well. And we're hoping that would be quite an informal um, aspect of the event. And we'll also be looking at some recommendations and kind of action plans going into the uh, event next week towards the end. So um, I'm going to be introducing the speakers. Um, thank you all so much for agreeing to take part. Um, it's an amazing company to be in, and I'm honored to be able to um, share a few points from each of your buyers, but also feel free to kind of go into more detail as well. I'm just going to give a brief overview. Um, so, our first panelist is Kwam Anmashan, and he is the head of the group claims marketing at Lee Day. And uh, Kwam also helped to set up Lee Day's uh, first BAME committee and also sits on the marketing committee for the Black, Black Solicitors Network. And we're also joined with Dexter Dice QC, who is a human rights barrister at Gardenport Chambers, and um, also is involved in so many other great, amazing things. And I'm sure we'll be hearing a lot more about um, your particular experiences in relation to uh, the topic of this event um, in your section. Um, thank you both for joining. And we also have Evan Bera Johnson, who is a defense uh, barrister uh, specializing in crime and regulatory law at 25 Bedford Row Chambers. And uh, our fourth panelist is Lauren Messrs. Taylor, who is a criminal defense lawyer at MTC Solicitors, and she specializes in serious crime, uh, notably murder and fraud, and she is a solicitor and high rights advocate. Also, Sonali Knight QC, uh, who's a public law and immigration QC at Garden Court Chambers. Also, I wanted to say a big congratulations to you um, on your a huge success today um, in court in relation to the 70 hour notice rule um, for deportation. It's really inspiring to hear about. Um, and I will uh, carry on going. They've got uh, four more amazing panelists left. So, Mark Robinson, uh, who's a criminal defense lawyer and uh, also has a really inspiring journey that um, is quite difficult to summarize into a snippet, but I'm sure we're going to be hearing. Um, a lot more about your experience. I'm looking forward to that too. And um, also Anila Samurai, who is a trainee solicitor at Hodge Jones and Allen Solicitors and also is a Human Blade Boys committee member. And Natasha Shatunde, who is a barrister at Garden Court Chambers and is also co-founder and chair of the Black Barristers Network. 
And finally, we have Kristen Weaver, who is a people barrister at Garden Court North Chambers, and is also uh, the one behind the Law in 60 Second videos, which I really like. Um, so thank you all uh, so much for agreeing to take part in our uh, third panel session. Uh, apologies, I might have spoken a little bit too fast, I just wanted to make sure that I got through all that before we get into the discussion. I'm going to pass on to um, Kuan first uh, to talk a little bit about your experiences and reflections uh, for about five minutes or so, and then we'll move on to um, our following speaker after that. Hi, everybody. Um, it's nice to be on the panel this evening, uh, especially as the only, on, uh, only non-lawyer. Um, I feel slightly special in that, so thanks for the invite, Anila. Um, I think it's been a long old year, and I remember during the summer, um, I almost got to a point where I said, oh, I don't want to have any more discussions about race um, with, with at work or with colleagues or in general, and I kind of wanted to tap out of the discussion around racism because I felt like I've been having it like my whole life and I remember in a meeting it was the first time I'd ever kind of brought it up with colleagues very openly uh, in a team that, um, that that is is very diverse and mixed but I kind of said that I was I was sick and tired of discussing race and racism and it, or it kind of being but at the same time I was also kind of tired that it had been ignored in so many uh, facets of of life and kind of overlooked that a, a lot of the time as, as black people, we had to go into work and kind of put aside the fact that we would see videos and, and recordings of, um, of, of black people, African Americans in particular being killed um, on social media and it was being consumed almost as entertainment. Um, so I kind of shot myself off for it a little bit and um, uh, in, in getting this invite, I almost, <laughs> I, I almost I laughed to myself, as, oh, I'm, now I have to go and discuss race again, but. I do think it's really important that uh, these conversations are being had um, in the, within the legal sector because there's obviously a, a very long way to go. Um, at Lee Day, I, I feel uh, in some ways that we, uh, we're seen as a very left law firm. Um, and I think sometimes that can be an excuse not to kind of um, uh, examine uh, our kind of uh, thoughts on race and Last year, we set up the, the our first BAME committee, um, and I remember there was a group of us uh, who set it up, and we kind of said that we would um, be kind of un uncompromising um, in, in in what we wanted to uh, kind of discuss and bring to the table around race, because we we said that even though everyone at the firm kind of has these ideals and and has this liberal belief uh, of who we are and the cases that we do. We, had, we said that um, people still need to be challenged on this. Um, so in the last year, we, we've, we've managed to uh, have quite a lot of complex discussions around race and which culminated in uh, an event earlier this year uh, with uh, Leslie Thomas QC, Maya Goodfellow, Dave Nita and Maria Munir, chaired by Kieran Dorka, who's uh, an employment partner at our firm, which uh, tackled what it meant to be British. Um, and I remember after the event, just feeling like really proud that we had been able to put that on um, and have that discussion. Um, and a number of people who attended it said that they had never been to a, an event that discussed race um, in such an open way that was held by a law firm. Um, so I do always try and go back to that event and, and some of those comments and, and think that there is still a lot of work to do um, in these discussions and although it can be tiring and draining and exhausting and all that and sometimes we just want to sit at home and watch trash tv like everybody else that it is really important that obviously that there is still a long way to go and, and having these discussions is um really important and um i'm glad that at Lido day we are ha having some of these discussions even though there is a lot more work to do um and uh i'm ha glad to be here tonight to contribute to this discussion Thanks, Kwa. Um, we'll definitely be picking up on some of the um, some of the points that you mentioned. And also, um, I heard pretty really great things about the Leslie Thomas event as well. And um, it's definitely something that we're conscious about in terms of n not having a kind of conversation um, fatigue in bringing up issues that you see recurringly throughout um, the year, but 
Zoom will definitely want some sort of action plan to arise from that. So individuals don't feel that they're just you know repeating the same thing and that it's not um, you know leading to something. So hopefully there'll be um, some kind of conclusions that we can come forward from today and definitely work on going forward. And um, something that I'm really conscious of kind of supporting and um, committing to. So thanks for raising that. Um, I'll move on to Dexter Dice QC um, and then we'll go through each of the speakers and then uh, go into a bit more of a discussion about the points that you mentioned. Um, so thanks, Colin, for your introduction. Yes, so uh, Hapsa, thank you so much. I've got uh, five minutes, which is even more punishing than the US Supreme Court. So let me get right to it. I think there are three things that I want to talk about. The first one is the then. The title of tonight is Racial Diversity in the Legal Professions, then and now. Well, I am the then. I am the way back then. In fact, when I did pupillage, there was someone called Margaret Thatcher, who was the prime minister. And at that point, a husband could not rape his wife. So that gives you an indication how far back that was. When I was uh, applying for a tenancy, uh, I was taken aside by one chambers who said, well, you've got all the credentials, et cetera, et cetera, but we've just taken an ethnic barrister, as they called him, and we're not ready for another. Now, would that happen uh, today? I doubt it. Well, at least it wouldn't happen explicitly. But one of the questions we need to think about is, is the system of exclusion uh, more subtle? Perhaps we can talk about that later. Scroll forward a few years. I've been a tenant at Garden Court. I've taken silk. I was then chair of the Bar's Equality and Diversity Training Committee, and part of my function, my committee, was to try to implement David Newberger's report into access to the profession for non-traditional um, applicants. And what I would do is I'd go uh, into one of the rooms um, at the Bar Council after court and stand there, literally in front of 50 to um, sometimes 60 uh, almost exclusively white barristers and to try to talk to them about race and discrimination and frankly uh, some of them used to walk out. Persevering a few years later and keeping going at that point chambers would contact us and rather than it being an onerous obligation they would come to us and ask for training and I think that is tangible evidence of some kind of change. Not enough, but it's interesting to think why that happened. Perhaps we can discuss that. Anyway, that's the first topic. Second topic, enough of the anecdotes. What I want to do is to offer you all a few critical tools, some intellectual ammunition. If we are serious about talking about and tackling racism within the justice system, how do we think about it? I started off my career at Garden Court uh, defending about 18 months worth of anti-apartheid activists who would be constantly arrested at a 24-7 protest outside uh, South Africa House in Trafalgar Square. And they made me understand that we only get the rights that we are prepared to fight for. And in that sense, we also get the legal system and the legal profession we deserve. What are we going to do about it? What, how are we prepared to fight and challenge it? What is the system of law? Read Bourdieu. Pierre Bourdieu uh, classifies the law in, as part of the coercive state. Is it safety net? Is it part of that coercion? Think about that. Bourdieu asks us to think about whether we can change it meaningfully from inside, or do you have to be outside the system? My question is, can you change it if you are exclusively outside the system? Think about what that system is in terms of racialized justice. Read Vacan, Loïc Vacan. Vacan talks about a carceral continuum, how it is that what, how the system operates in terms of minority 
um, populations is that there are uh, ghettos, as he calls them, that are extrajudicial prisons and prisons which are basically legal ghettos. If that is right, think about the consequences or the sort of social Darwinism that certain parties are trying to promote. How do you change things? First question, the antecedent question is, should we actually try to change things? Read Foucault. Foucault tells us, think carefully before you do intervene, because what you could do is make things worse. The law of unintended consequences. There is a lot of evidence that equality and diversity training is actually counterproductive. But that is a question of how it is delivered and who is going to be delivering it. So we should talk about that. There's a lot of talk, and I've been uh, asked by various universities about decolonization of curriculum and decolonization of the law. Read Fanon. France, uh, Fanon tells us, look, before you can start to decolonize these other social institutions, there is a first step, which is you've got to start doing your personal act of decolonizing your own mind. How do we do that in a system of racialized justice? What I would love to think about and talk about is how we can develop a new generation of lawyers that has these critical perspectives. We want to fight racism. What is race? Do we know what it is? We want to fight institutional racism. What produces it? What are the mechanisms that produce and reproduce it? Are we prepared to do the work to find out? And can we actually do that work together? So third and final point, just to wrap up, is by asking you a question, really. What is our responsibility? I was sitting um, as a part-time judge in South London in a Crown Court. And a case came in front of me, a young black man who had been convicted of magistrates of using his mobile phone in a car. And he was so outraged by this officer who he said was racist and um, objected to the fact that he was a young, well-dressed black professional with a very, very expensive car that he'd pulled him for no reason, invented a spurious re uh, reason for the stop. I was with two lay magistrates, and when we came back after hearing the appeal, um, as the judge, I was the person who announced uh, the decision, and we said to him that we'd allowed the appeal. And he looked down, and he just said, um, can I have time to uh, pay the fine? And I said, no, no, look, you've, um, we've allowed the appeal, there, we, we've dismissed these charges. And he said, yes, but I've started a new job, and I need time to pay. And it was so interesting because it took me three times before I could actually communicate to him that we had allowed his appeal. And when he got it, he did something, this very confident young person that astonished us. He burst into tears. And I said to him, why did that happen? And he said, do you know, Judge, what we call in our community these courts? And I said, I don't. And he said, we call them police support. Now, think about the consequences for our system of justice and also for social cohesion when in the 21st century, that is a prevalent ideation. That is a view of how the courts, which you and I hope to operate in, are perceived. What can we do about it? The last thing I want to say is this, that Dr. King, of course, taught us that the time is always right to do the right thing. And in terms of fighting uh, racial discrimination and oppression, the time has been right for about 400 years. And that library book is long overdue. So I think what we should talk about this evening is how we could get to work. Yes, thank you. Well, thanks so much, Dexter. Um, and definitely want to pick up later on um, what you mentioned uh, in terms of decolonization of education and. Um, how to develop a new generation of lawyers. I think it's definitely um, prompted a few uh, considerations that we can pick up on. Uh, so thanks so much for your uh, brief introduction. Um, I'm going to be moving on to our next speaker, which is Adam Bola Johnson. Uh, if you want to go ahead, please. Thanks. Hi guys. Um, so yes, I'm Adam Bola or Abby. 
Um, and I think I was, I've been trying to kind of like think over the last couple of days of what I would say during the course of my introduction. And while the others were talking and I was, of course, listening to what they were saying, but I was also looking through the list of participants to see if there were names that I recognised and, and so on. And it does appear to me as though we have quite a diverse set of um, panellists, but also participants in this webinar. One thing I'm really conscious of is when we often come together um, as groups of ethnic minorities to discuss these issues, it sort of turns into us a discussing topics that we're all aware of because we're describing experiences that we already ex that are exposed to day to day. And like Quam has said, it's exhausting. And I think also I'm very conscious that this is Black History Month. This is a time for us to look at progress to look at things in a positive light because so often when we talk about black experiences I think we do them from positions of trauma and positions of negativity which is entirely valid but it takes a mental toll I don't know about you guys but this year has been mentally very very draining and the last couple of days in particular as a first generation Nigerian has been absolutely exhausting for me and Tash is a very good friend of mine we've been talking about this all day and just how utterly tired we are so actually what I want to do with my contribution is sort of turn it around if I may and talk about the fact that these are really concerning times I think that we have a government who is wayward and who doesn't understand and doesn't really want to engage with challenging conversations around race and around progress within those areas. I think that we are at risk of taking a lot of backward steps at the moment from the way that Kemi Badenoch has spoken about decolonization of curriculums to the way that Bin Mafalami was addressing the government yesterday and effectively saying that because he went to Eton, you know, there isn't an issue with black people going to very elitist institutions, despite the fact that he is the son of a doctor, went to Oxford and so on. Um, so my view is that I really want to use this time for us to think about the ways that we can protect the profession, for us to think about the ways that we no longer have to continue having these conversations in 10, 15 years. You know, we've got some black pupils who are coming into chambers. We have black QCs, black senior juniors, black junior juniors, and so on. So black people all the way through um, at my set of chambers at 25, which I'm very grateful for. But what it makes me very conscious of is that I can be sat in a room and I can be talking to one of the black QCs and describing experiences that I've had in court. And there's so much crossover in what we are describing. And very uh, obviously, like some of the things that I experience are a lot more subtle than the things that somebody like Dexter, for example, would have experienced a couple of decades ago. But those underlying issues still remain. And I want to kind of open up the conversation and ask a lot of you guys, especially those of you who are coming up into the profession, what it is that you're concerned about, you know, what it is that causes you anxiety when you think about entering the profession and what it is that you would like to see changed as well. So I know that I want to stop these conversations from being necessary. And one else aspect of that is that I'm talking a lot more openly about my experiences. I'm not making space for those things to happen anymore. And I'm very vocal if I see anything like that happening to anybody, particularly somebody who is more junior than I am. And I'm also taking it into my practice in a way that I was very nervous to do initially. You know, like if I'm representing somebody and I think that they are being undermined in any way, whether it's directly or indirectly to do with their race, I will question it. You know, I'll say to my opponent, why have you said that? Why have you made that assumption? Why are we starting from this basis? Where are we going with that? And that kind of thing. And it's been interesting to see the kind of reactions that her, those have provoked. I think because I am somebody who speaks the way that I do, uh, because I'm someone who went to Oxford and because I can navigate certain circles, I think that sometimes white members of the profession feel very comfortable around me and they say certain things that I don't think they would say to others. And it's just been quite interesting to see some of those. I was in one circumstance where I was um, sitting in 
a, a room with a co-defending co council and there were five of us. So we were each, there were four defence counsel, one prosecutor. So each of us was representing a, a defendant individually, four black men. And the person that I was speaking to referred to the uh, men who were in the dock as the darkies. And, and he did that in front of me, like while I'm sat there, he's talking to another colleague. There's only three of us in this room. I'm part of the conversation. And he refers to these defendants as darkies, one of whom he is representing himself. And I stood up and said, I'm not making time for this. And I walked out of the room, end of the conversation. And you know, at the beginning of my career, I think I would have felt quite hesitant to have done that. I would maybe have made a face or laughed a bit uncomfortably or, you know, just like made it clear that I wasn't quite okay with it, but also in a very subtle way. Whereas now it's just stuff that I don't make space for. Anyway, by the end of that case, he was extraordinarily apologetic. It was quite uncomfortable actually. I feel like sometimes when people apologize too much, they're putting the onus back on you to make them feel better. And I wouldn't do it. Um, but it's just small steps like that, which I think can be quite difficult to do when you're very, when you're very often the only melanated face in a room and you're in a position where these are people who could be making decisions that have an impact or an effect on your client's case. Um, but yeah, I just wanna say to you guys, I'd be very interested in hearing what it is that you have experienced, what you want to see from us. And in terms of specific things that I can think of that I would like to see change in the profession, they would be things like us introducing more personality awareness of bar students as they come up through the system so that they are more aware of the triggers that they have in terms of how they listen and how they communicate to other people so that they can take charge of that and introduce that into their practice as they come across people who are from different backgrounds to them. I'd like to see soft skills being very emphasised in terms of social consciousness and consciousness around racial diversity, but also class diversity, neurodiversity, and so on. And I wanna see those aspects being taught as fundamental aspects of being a good lawyer, and rather than them being add-ons. So this whole discussion around things like equality and diversity training or anti-racism training, I understand where it's coming from, but I would actually really like to see it permeated throughout everything that we learn at every stage that we learn things. So it's actually just an inherent part of our training rather than being this separate add-on. And so that we recognize that in everything that we should be doing, we should be very aware of tackling those issues and very aware of being in a position where we work in systems that perpetuate those issues. And even as members of ethnic minority groups, unless we are consciously working against those, we are still part of the problem. The fact that we have the skin color that we do does not mean that we're not harmful in the same way or in similar ways that our white colleagues are. So yeah, that's my, uh, my little ranty intro for you guys. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, I, I completely um, agree in terms of um, everything you mentioned and I would like to um, talk further about what you mentioned and uh, in terms of anxiety about the profession that your young entrants would be seeing and, and seeing change in that way as well. Um, and kind of like the soft skills aspect of it, which isn't actually talked about much at all um, and kind of emphasizing that as a fundamental aspect of the profession and, and not just an add-on like, like you said. Um, so thanks so much. I'm looking forward to um, discussing that further in the next um, portion of the event. Um, I will just pass on to um, the next panelist, Lauren. Um, yes, Lauren versus Taylor, and um, hopefully we'll be able to come back to a few things that you mentioned, but thanks so much for your contribution. Hi there, yep, I'm Lauren, and I am uh, one of the directors at MTC Solicitors. Um, it's interesting to know where to start, uh, I, I, I hear what Abby's saying is we are quite tired of having to say, have the same sort of conversations. And uh, as she's rightly said, across the board, no matter who you speak to, 
they're having the same experiences. Um, so from my perspective, I am a solicitor, I'm a higher rights advocate, I'm a police station duty, I'm a magistrate's court duty. So I get to see cases from their inception all the way through, um, which means that I get to deal with the police, I deal with the CPS, I deal with uh, prosecuting lawyers, defense uh, lawyers. And it's interesting the way how I feel that uh, it's, it's, it's really not until I got into the legal profession that I actually felt that I was being discriminated against. Um, so there's, there's different types of uh, uh, discrimination. I mean, there's, there's outward bias, uh, very easy to, uh, ironically easier to deal with when somebody is directly racist towards you because then you can deal with that head on. But it's then the unconscious bias that uh, I think has been brought into the into the forefront when we as uh, as lawyers walk into courts and our names are checked automatically on the defendant's list, no matter how well dressed you're put together. The automatic assumption is that you are a defendant rather than you are somebody representing a defendant, and. It, it is something that, that I am glad is actually being brought to the forefront more because you actually get used to dealing with it. You get used to dealing with it. You get used to calling it out. But if you just call it out to one person every time you do it, that's not solving the bigger problem. And I, and I think bringing it out and highlighting it as it has been in more recent months it's going to make it a little bit more effective moving forward. For my own personal circumstances, as I said, I get to see the different ways in which the police officers deal with uh, suspects at the police station, according to their race, religion. You can see and you can hear it in the, in the environment that you're in, the, the, the disparaging comments that are made. I've had comments made about myself. Um, my office is in the middle of South Kilburn Estate. There's a lot of young black boys that hang out on the estate with their friends, people that they've grown up with. The police come around the area. They bundle them into the police van. They take them to areas where they know that they have problems and they throw them out the police van and watch them and laugh and joke as they have to run out of the area. Um, myself and my colleague were outside of my office on one occasion when the uh, officers were quite disrespectful to um, a group of the boys who threw rubbish on the ground. And uh, we said, well, look, they've done something wrong. Why don't you just speak with them in a civilized manner and ask them to pick it up? And the response was uh, that we have no right to challenge or say anything to the police because we ourselves are not civilized. And it just makes you think, well, I'm in a position where I'm, I'm, I'm a black female, I'm educated, I'm articulate, I'm having a conversation with a police officer and his response to me was to tell me that I'm uncivilized. And then you think to yourself, well, the young boys who they have to deal with, who can't articulate themselves in the same way, some of them, some of them can, some of them can't, but the discrimination and the bias that they face it is really quite worrying. And I've had markers put on myself and my colleagues, we've had markers put on our vehicles by the police um, because the assumption for them is if a black solicitor is representing a young black defendant, then we're friends, we're family, we, we, we are associates of each other. And that resulted in us having to make a complaint to the uh, borough commander at the Brent police and he had to come down first of all they had to take the markers off of our cars then they had to come down and apologize and actually we had a decent conversation sitting down and actually expressing the issues that we are having with the police that nobody gets to hear about and nobody gets to see and these are the sort of things that need to be brought to the forefront because how are we going to tackle 
dealing with this moving forward and and i and i i understand what do we do about the training they have the equality and diversity training but it doesn't change the unconscious bias and i think it's it's uh, and i'm not trying to worry anybody about going into the legal profession i've been qualified since 2002 and i absolutely love what i do because i feel that i treat everybody the same i give my all in terms of my representation in relation to the clients that I come across. And just like what Abby's saying, when somebody says something that I find offensive or something that is racist, I call it out right there and right then. But I think we need to do more about bringing it into the, the open arena, which is what uh, debates like this are, are about, bringing it out into the open arena. To giving to empower each individual person who's considering going into whatever profession it is that you're going into to empower you to give you the voice to understand that each person is powerful in their own right and each person should stand up for themselves when they know something is being done against them and i've been guilty of it myself i've been quiet about a lot of things you know when you hear something in the news now you think well that happened to me that's been happening to me for years but i didn't say anything so I think now is the time to bring these things to the forefront. And as tiresome as it is, it's bringing it to, like I said, bringing it to the forefront now will help those, uh, the young ones uh, coming up. So that's a lot to say as an introduction. Thanks so much, Lauren. Um, and um, everything that you mentioned before also kind of resonates with one of the previous comments about sometimes equality and diverse training being counterproductive and that it definitely needs to go further. Um, so thanks so much for your um, introduction and contribution. Um, I'm going to be moving on to Sonali Knight QC. Um, and also we mentioned this before, but I just wanted to say again, uh, you know, huge congratulations on your um, Court of Appeal success today in relation to deportations. Um, and you probably have such a busy day, so um, I don't want to keep you too long, but thanks so much for taking part and I'll pass over to you now. Well, thanks very much, Hafsa. Can you see me on the mm -hmm. I've got myself on? Um, I'll speak of you. Um, well, thank you very much. I mean, yes, it has been quite an exhausting day, but perhaps it's it's not it's less exhausting when you win, <laughs> really. So that's. Um, but it's been a uh, it's just a rep today is a representation actually of all the work that I think I've done over the last what is almost thirty years in immigration and asylum. And I've chosen to specialise in that field because it's just struck it it strikes everything I want to achieve as a barrister. Well, you know, in terms of human rights, marginalised communities, access to justice, public law, immigration law, it's it is, it is everything I've ever wanted to work on. But it, it's it's just really interesting just to look back at when I was called to the bar, 1991. The first thing that happened to me was like when you have to join. In fact, when I went to bar school, you have to jo obviously you have to join in one of the inns of court. And the first thing that the Middle Temple said to me when I went in to, I don't know what you have to do, get your photo card or something. They said, oh, are you going to practice here or are you going to go back to your own country to practice? So that was my absolutely first experience of being in Middle Temple. And that was obviously that was really I was so disappointed because I just was so enthusiastic and so keen. And I just had really was felt so alienated on the first day one of my whole bar career. And I'd, you know, to be fair, I'd come from Oxford and I'd had various what might be described as negative experiences in that traditional setting in that time. But then and I wasn't necessarily expecting the bar to be very open and inclusive, but, you know, day one was pretty, pretty disappointing. Flash forward 30 years or nearly 30 years. Um, and I'll say I'll tell you why this story still resonates is that you, know, you think oh, I've got to what I really wanted. I really wanted to become a QC. I wanted to be seen and to have that recognition that the bar gives people of excellence. And there are only I found out then there are only 22 um, BAME, I use that term for these purposes, women, at the, at the, certainly by that, the time I was appointed, 22 out of about 1800. So it's about 1%. And there are lots of reasons why, obviously, why women leave the profession or don't progress in the profession. But then, and people, and lots of people talking about that and, you know, having children and, and other discrimination. But nobody would ever really articulate what were the obstacles to the progression of black people, 
in the legal profession, why are there only 22 black women? And actually, if you look at the statistics on men, they're pretty poor. And if you look at the statistics specifically on black men, they're very poor. Similarly, that's something like in the low, um, the low 1%. When I Fairly, fairly early on when I became a silk and I went to the Court of Appeal, the first thing, and I set all my, my papers out in the silks row, and the usher said to me, oh, I'm sorry, you can't sit there because only silks can sit there. So not understanding the fact that they knew that I was coming because obviously they have a list of the advocates who were coming before you get there, notwithstanding that I am a silk and I was wearing a silk gown and a silk jacket and all that bloody paraphernalia, Still, that was how I was treated. So the, the stories people are saying, I got mistaken for the defendant and mistaken for the interpreter and all those things that all happened to, I'm sure, I am absolutely sure all or many um, black and Asian barristers. You know, it's, it happens at all levels of the profession and it, those examples, that beginning and end or beginning and not my, hopefully my career's intended beginning and, and most recent, it was, just an, uh, demonstrates that there's a long way to go, despite the, pro the progress that people think that they've made. And I'm absolutely sure that everyone has been, I mean, the usher who said that to me was not, was, wasn't white. So, but the, his perception of what the QC was supposed to look like wasn't me. Um, and he probably has had the diversity and equality training and all the rest of it. So I, I think that obviously the training is a very limited part um, of, um, of how we affect change. How I think we affect change is by being visible. So um, that's what will affect that will that's what will achieve change in the legal profession is by seeing the, the most diverse people um, and that's across all types of uh, communities. And obviously in, in some ways Asian people are overrepresented in within that Bain uh, group, if you like. And I acknowledge that I've seen people talking about that in the chat and I rec totally recognize that in the same way that I recognize the statistics, particularly on black men in the profession um, uh, and certainly in, in the silks at the silks level uh, underrepresented. So what we need, but we need to, in order to achieve change, there needs to be visibility. We need to have vocal role models. I mean, that's I strongly believe in that. This is about leadership and being seen and being heard and pushing on the conversation with the institutions, that's the judiciary, the Judicial Appointments Commission, with the Bar Council. I mean, one thing I've noticed recently that the Bar Council are doing is that they've started, um, they've instituted this reverse mentoring scheme. I don't know if Dexter had anything to do with that. That's quite a progressive model. And it's at least, I think, trying to identify that people who, who wield power need to understand the position of people who are subjected to that power, who are junior, um, who won't necessarily, even, even if you're a barrister, and even if you're vocal and articulate, and that's what you've been trained to do, in the context of your own career progression or your own experiences, you may not be so vocal. People attend, you know, I'm a passionate advocate for my clients. I may not be a passionate advocate for, or as passionate about my own experiences of, uh, of that I've ex uh, experienced. So, that I think is um, a good initiative, but obviously that's only a, a relatively limited initiative. But I do think we want to um, to hear the stories and the the um, experiences, and I think one of, of of people's of the discrimination that people have faced. And unless it's recorded and then acknowledged, then we can move forwards in terms of in terms of tackling it. I, th I think that too long we it, those sort of stories have been swept under the carpet and. I, often didn't, you know, hadn't been, nobody had asked me any of the questions as to what my experiences as a black person at the bar were. So it ne never, it was never, it was never documented. Um, and that only really started happening when I became a QC because somebody realized actually that there were so few women or, um, and black people in my position. So that's became the focus of why, um, you know, what, why the, the, the the uh, issue was even spoken about. Um, just in turn, we're just looking back at what we've just moving on the, the conversation. Um, how we, I mean, one, a specific example actually of tackling racism and a, one that really was quite 
close to my heart and why we need to achieve change is that if you have a whole panel of judges who are all white and you have a whole panel of lawyers advocating both for the government and the applicants who are all white, in an immigration case, which is about discrimination and the right to rent, which was, say, the JCWI case, well, I think well, maybe they were, almost all the lawyers, I think, were white. It's very difficult. And when the courts say, well, we know that the scheme was capable of being operated in a discriminatory fashion, but all the landlords have to do is obey the law. That did not, their, the judge's experience and the advocate's experience and the, the way in which the case was presented and understood was that people don't, people are not losing accommodation or being rejected from accommodation on the grounds of the color of their skin. And if, I just do not believe that if that panel of judges and advocates had all been black, that that judgment would have been the same. Just, it's impossible to imagine. And so we need to hopefully to move from the token, who I don't know who was talking about that, I think Dexter was that the token or singular black person in any room or any panel of judges or any legal team to being a, a majority or even, um, you know, being an entirely black court. And then you will see a different result. Um, and that's, you know, there was the, in the Supreme Court recently, there was a majority of women who sat on the Supreme Court panel for the first time ever. And that is the kind of change we need to see in the context of race and racial diversity. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and I agree, it would be really interesting to see if there is any research or potential research on what are the obstacles behind why there are only 22 black women represented. Um, and definitely in, in terms of pushing on conversations with Bar Council and Judiciary, um, hopefully next week's event will um, be working towards achieving um, some uh, conversation and plans going forward. Um, thank you so much for your contribution. Um, and we'll move on to our next speaker before we go into the discussion portion. Um, it's Mark Robinson, if you want to go ahead. Thanks so much. Hi, um, so um, Mark, as you guys may or may not know. Now, unlike the, um, many of you have had experiences of being a lawyer mistaken for the defendant. If you have heard briefly about my story, I was actually the defendant that was mistaken for a lawyer. Um, the reason I got into law is that I represented myself in Woolwich Crown Court twice after being forced to accuse by my wife's ex-partner of an ABH. I ended up um, being taken on by the solicitor's firm as a credit police rep after. And um, even the arresting officer actually gave me career advice about being a police rep. The prosecutor, um, David Jenkins, God rest his soul, um, he encouraged me as well to get into law. And this is off the back of been in quite a bit of trouble when I in my younger days. Um, initially, I, I was brought up in foster care. I left school with no GCSEs, no A levels, um, and it got through to university um, and ended up graduating with a T one from Birkbeck. And it's been a blessed journey. I'm currently a criminal defence solicitor, and I've got six weeks left of being a solicitor. I'm transferring to the bar, and um, Chambers is ready, and I hope to be in Chambers by the first of December. So I'll be seeing you guys quite regularly. Now, my thing is what I, I think I notice with the profession and my observations are, I mean, I've been in court every day since I qualified in, in June in the mags. Now, I think Lauren would probably agree with, with me on this point. At the lower end of the, of the criminal justice system, I've been in court when it's completely filled with black and Asian lawyers. I've, you know, I've, I've gone a week with, with only seeing one white prosecutor. Every prosecutor has been black, a black woman or an Asian woman, and they're all solicitors. And for me, as someone who's about to cross over into that, and I've heard you guys talk, the problem is the bar. I don't think, I think that, that in time, terms of criminal justice, in terms of immigration law, in terms of the people that own the, fir the, the firms, I don't think there's a problem with diversity uh, as much. It is, uh, you know, I, I know a lot of people that instruct me on a daily basis, it's black owned firms, Asian owned firms. And for whatever reason is, it is, is the bar is not hitting the mark. Now, what I do see is an awful lot of you guys at the bar have gone to Oxbridge, you've gone to Russell Groups. That's an automatic 
no, no. For someone like myself who went to a totally crap um, um, secondary school, I got booted out. Um, of all my black friends that, that I went to school with in my class, every one of them has been to jail, and it's not a joke. Uh, I have. Um, I was in. I was brought up in care. Both my brothers have been to prison. My mum has been to prison. Yeah. All I see is everyone around me in jail into crime, and I nearly ended up there. You know, I was involved with gangs when I was younger. So when we talk about diversity and real diversity, what really needs to change is not people whose parents encourage them or they've been or they've wanted the more reputable universities. How do we get people who went to I went to Birkbeck or how do we get people that went to University of East London? How do we get to people that went to was it Hertfordshire University, you know, the Metro, London Metropolitan Universities into the profession because there's a all, all there's an awful lot of bias that I see. Even being more nuanced into the problem, throughout all of my undergraduate days, I was the only black British born person in my class. Loads of Asian people, loads of Nigerian people, Ghanaians, um, Somalians, everyone. I was the only black British born guy. When I went to do my LPC, again, class out of 30 people, the only black British born guy of Caribbean heritage. So what is what is going on? What why is this? And for me, we, we, I've seen all these bar initiatives about let's do this and reverse mentoring and they're all good, yeah. But guess what? It's not gonna hit the mark. And the reason I, I, I can say that, yeah, is unless you get the demographic of people where I came from, who went to a bog standard state school, not no private school, because believe me, at the bar, there's plenty of black and Asian middle class people. There's plenty of people whose parents were doctors, lawyers that had, apart from dent of color of skin, they had just as much advantage, yeah, barring the color of skin, I'm very specific when I say that. But unless the bar opens up and, and acknowledges that there's a problem with class, and instead of this box ticking where, you know, we've got a black member in chambers, they went to Oxbridge and got an Oxbridge first, but, you know, we, we still tick a box. No, it's not good enough. You need to reach out more. Now, one suggestion I had with a barrister the other day when we was doing one of these networking kind of things is that times with COVID have really put on a, a fine and um, put a lot of chambers on financial, um, you know, hardship, you know, privileges might not be offered so, uh, as much. But I think that maybe it's time for the inns of court to do their bit. Now, what my recommendations would be is why not the inns of court fund privileges and take the onus of, of chambers? On top of that, then you have to have every privilege that goes through, you have to have someone from state to school. Now, what you'll find in that state school policy is even if they went to Oxbridge on a scholarship, the fact that they went to state school, you'll catch the demographic of people you actually want, like myself. And I've got loads of good aspiring lawyers, they message me all the time, but they're like, Mark, we, you know, we've only gone to UEL, we've only gone to Westminster, what can we do? And these people are excluded. They're not any less intelligent than anyone that's gone to Oxbridge, but it's this Oxbridge culture, and it's a classist thing. So you may be asking yourself, how does this is going to work? How is the inns of court going to fund this? Well, look, all the rent that you guys pay, and I'm probably about to pay, would go to the next round of pupillage. What I would say is on top of the practice certificate, every single practicing barrister would maybe contribute a couple of hundred pound into a, a fund, which would go into their inn, where the inn could then give scholarships are based on need to pupils coming through. You have a big catchment area, you have more pupillages available. And again, there's a policy where we're not interested in um, um, so much the university, but it is about the state school. And, and there is, is the problem I see. I think that we need to really acknowledge this. And I think that there's so much initiatives and there's all this mini pupillages and all that is great, but it's just not, it's just not, we're gonna be still talking about this. I know you guys have said it's sad that we don't wanna be talking about this in, in years to come, but the only thing you're gonna change is to really reach out. And the, if the whole bar is serious, I think that if every 
practicing barrister, I think there's meant to be 15,000 contributed 200 pound a year. How much money would that be as a pot of money where the inns could select people the same way they give out scholarships before entering the BBTC. So the, so the, the owners would be off of the chambers and then, you know, it would just, it would make the, the profession much more refreshing. So that's my thoughts on that guys. So there you go. Thanks so much, Mark. I definitely think that would increase like social mobility as well. Um, and like the, being conscious of the professions, not just doing things as a box ticking exercise um, and like having that state school representation, um, I definitely agree. Um, so thanks so much. Definitely gonna pick up on that in the um, Q and A. And I think a question came in about that as well, but I'm gonna look at that at the end. Uh, but thanks so much, Mark. Um, I will pass on now to Anila, if you want to go next, thank you. That was the one thing I was trying not to do. Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> um, but my name's Anila and I'm a trainee solicitor at Hodge Jones and Allen Solicitors in London. Um, I'm from Nottingham and I've paralegaled at Barty Best Solicitors in Nottingham and also Lee Day Solicitors where I met Quam. Um, and I think like Mark said, I've been fortunate enough to work in quite diverse law firms um, with a lot of like brown lawyers and some black lawyers. And what I wanted to talk about were conversations that are ongoing at the moment, particularly at a junior level, um, that are quite interesting and important in my opinion. So one of those is as a brown person, um, I'm of Indian heritage. Um, it's sort of recognizing the relative privilege that I have compared to black colleagues. And these are kind of difficult conversations to have, um, kind of awkward sometimes, um, but I think they're really important. So the fact that I've worked at firms that are amazing and are diverse um, is great, but I think there is, there is an issue in that just because there might be quite a few Indian middle-class partners doesn't mean that the diversity box is ticked. And there are beginning to be more conversations about anti-blackness in the legal profession and what needs to be done to tackle that. Because as a brown person, I benefit from the model minority myth, the myths that you know brown people are hardworking and good at maths and spelling and go on to become doctors and lawyers. And I compare that to the stereotypes and myths around black colleagues and black people generally um, of laziness and criminality um, and you know, aspiring to being sports people or rappers. It's, it's very, very different. And that is a relative privilege that I think a lot of, a lot of brown, well, all brown people have arguably. And it's something that like, is starting to be talked about a little bit. And I think that's maybe come off the back of discussions um, during the summer with the Black Lives Matter movement. And yeah, in my opinion, it's really important because we won't achieve meaningful progress in diversity unless we really grapple with anti-blackness in the profession and the different disadvantages that people from different ethnic groups face because the solutions to the problems have to be targeted and you can't have targeted solutions if you're taking a blanket approach to all BAME people, like it's just not gonna work. So yeah, that's something that I think is quite important, but it's not to be divisive. I know that some older um, or more experienced colleagues are of the age where they would, even though they're brown, they'd identify as black in like a political sense, because that's what people did that maybe more so in the eighties um, with protesting and campaigning. And sometimes there is a bit of hostility from those groups and more senior lawyers. Um, at the newer conversations that are beginning to be had because they could arguably be, arguably be seen as divisive. But I don't think that's the case. I think it's more about solidarity with people that belong to ethnic groups that are the most underrepresented in the profession. And it's just being realistic and pragmatic um, about the world that we live in. And it's not at all to undermine the disadvantages that brown people face, um, working class people face, um, women face just generally it's it's I think it's just a realistic way of having the conversations and I'd say that I have been often mistaken for an interpreter I've also been mistaken for a defendant at court I've had you know 
microaggressions at work. Um, got a complainy email from a client who said that the reason he wasn't eligible for legal aid was because I, um, people like you, me and my brown colleague, were in conspiracy with the legal aid agency, dishing out legal aid to terrorists, but not giving it to good English people. So I know that brown people still do face discrimination and disadvantages in the workplace. Um, but I think it's just positive that we're having more nuanced conversations and what are, they are difficult conversations, but I think they're very much needed. Um, so that's what I wanted to use my little introductory period to talk about. Thanks so much, Anila. Um, everything you said about relative privilege and targeted initiatives is really interesting. And I think um, a really valuable contribution. Thank you so much. Um, I will pass on now to Natasha, um, if you want to go ahead, thank you. Thanks guys, good evening everyone. I'm going to try and be um, quick because I'm really excited to start the uh, chat and answer questions in the Q&A. Um, luckily being near the end it's meant that I've managed to hear from some incredible speakers and I thought it would be a good opportunity for me to sort of pick up on some things that people have said. Um, perhaps maybe I could start with a uh, background going on Mark's points about um, the type of people that are barristers at the bar. Um, as some of you might know, my background is a uh, single parent, just me and my mum. And I went to a state school um, and in London and I went to Reading. So I didn't go to Russell Group University and I came to the bar. However, I, I'm putting out my story out there to be inspiring. I've been doing it for the last few years, but I'm fully aware that that is an exception. Um, and I am an exception rather than the rule. Um, indeed, when I, I didn't start off at Garden Court, I only moved to Garden Court in February of this year. And um, when I told my previous chambers that I was leaving, they just so happened to be having a dinner um, to celebrate a particular member of chambers that um, had uh, gone to the bench and so became a judge. And he was the head of the Pupilage Committee at the time. And he did some speech at the dinner about how um, he really prided himself and the committee on taking, giving people a chance who otherwise may have been overlooked by the chambers um, because of whatever it is within their application form or characteristics. And my team, then chambers director turned around to me that evening and said, yes, Natasha, I guess you benefited from that, didn't you? And then when I uh, was handing in my keys um, after my holiday, when I was deciding, finally moving to Garden Court, he said exactly the same thing. And I was just like, Tasha, hold your breath. You are leaving. You don't have to speak to this man again. But if he says it a third time, then the Tottenham in me might have to come out. So, yeah, <laughs> I'm definitely an exception rather than the rule. And that is definitely a problem. Um, going on to um, what Sonali said about her experience at um, her in at the start of her career, um, I've spoken before about um, a advocacy weekend that I was doing on the BPTC and a retired judge, so it was me and a group of my white colleagues, um, friends, um, were standing in a, in a circle and the, one of the retired judges turned to me and said, oh, so I suppose you'll be... Um, going back to your country to practice. So this stuff still happens. I mean, that was back in 2012. So, you know, nothing has changed. And I've spoken at talks where I've had um, BPTC students tell me similar stories. When are we gonna, when is something gonna change? We really need to make a change somehow through the inns, through our chambers, um, through everybody. And, um, just looking back at my time when I started off at the bar, there were no discussions when I started about race within the profession. In the previous chambers I was in, there was hardly any ethnic minorities in the chamber. In fact, there was one. So it was extremely isolating um, for me when I was going through pupillage and um, for a lot of my tenancy there. The big focus for the bar was on women. And um, last year when we did the 100 years of women in law thing, Ooh. Um, I was asked to go on a panel um, and in the talk I basically said that 
I hadn't attended a single uh, 100 Years of Women in Rome event. Um, I hadn't really felt connected to it at all. And the reason why I hadn't felt connected to it is because I don't think that they are celebrating people like me at the law. And when I talk about people like me, I talk about black women. When they're talking about these 100 Years of Women in Law, they're talking about white women. Um, and that's just made me completely detached from the whole thing. So coming on to, to the death of um, George Floyd and the recent uh, Black Lives um, uprising, shall we say, resurgence, I don't know what to call it, it's always been there. Um, that has certainly continued the conversations um, of race and it's continued them in a way that they've actually started to be listened to. Um, they have always taken place amongst um, barristers who are ethnic minorities. Um, we've always had conversations with the limited friends that we may have of ethnic minorities um, about the treatments that we've had in court and the treatments that we have in chambers, um, our concerns about our career progression. Um, but now we're having them loud and proud and people are actually listening to them. There are a number of things that I think um, the bar can do to um, try and improve these issues, some of which I think are certainly within our powers to do. I think there are other things that I am hopeful but slightly concerned may not take place. So there are some things that are regulatory. Um, we need to look at things like work allocation because that um, will, of course, have a massive effect on um, our ability to actually progress at the bar. Um, and I'm happy to talk about that in more detail later. Um, we need to talk about the promotion of barristers in chambers, who our chambers having on seminars, who are on the panels, who are being pushed to be ranked by chambers, who are being led in cases, particularly, because I used to practice in many different areas, and at the moment I'm doing a lot of family work, and I'm looking around at who's being led in these family cases, and it's the same white people over and over again. Um, who's been supported in QC applications and, and judicial um, applications? We also need to look at um, accountability. I think our regulator needs to hold chambers, all chambers, to account for its lack of diversity within its membership, uh, its recruitment, and also the progression of um, ethnic minority barristers and being the chair of the Black Barristers Network. I talk also about Black barristers specifically. Um, the bit that I'm concerned more about is um, about people's hearts and minds. I think the way in which um, behavioral change will take place so that we are not treated in a way which is um, discriminatory so that we are not having to hear conversations like the conversation that Adam Voller had mentioned um, so that we don't have to go through um, experiences of being patronized being mistaken to be the defendant being um, ignored being silenced etc that involves a lot of internal work by people particularly the perpetrators to actually look at themselves think about how they view people of other um, min ethnic minorities and particularly black people um, challenge their own internal thoughts and behaviors uh, and actually try and make a change and the reason why I'm a bit skeptical on that, or not skeptical, I'm concerned that some people will not do that work. is because I, when you're having to do this internal work, it's quite ugly. You're having to look at yourself and see yourself as a person that you don't necessarily want to see. Nobody wants to see themselves as a racist person. Nobody wants to see themselves as a horrible person. Um, so it is quite painful. And they don't benefit from it. And when you're asking someone to do something that's really painful and there's no upshot for them, it can be quite tricky. So that's where I'm concerned. But I'm hopeful that there will be some change. And I'm particularly hopeful that the allies that are coming out um, at the bar and in other places, the white allies that we have, will hopefully um, help us push for change as well. Thank you. Thanks so much, Natasha. And just following on from the last point you made about um, allies and um, hopefully soon to be looking at like how to be an effective ally as well um, going forward and putting those recommendations across to the regulators next week, because um, I think that will be quite a productive conversation, hopefully. 
Uh, so thank you so much for your contribution. I'll hand over now to Christian. Thanks so much for waiting patiently. So, and I look forward to the discussion, so I'll also keep this relatively short. Um, I'll make two main points, and I think effectively will encompass a lot of what's already been discussed. But as a pupil barrister, I'll talk a little bit about my experience leading up to being a pupil barrister, um, but also my own experience of microaggression. So I think I probably speak for all aspiring um, barristers when I say that you often worry that you're gonna feel out of place at the bar. So we spoke earlier about when you go to your inn and for myself, I was the only black British person at the qualifying sessions. You look around the walls of your inn and you see the faces of the, the barristers and judges that are meant to be the people that are meant to inspire you, the famous faces of your inn, but none of them look like you. You go on your bar course and you're the often the only black British student there again. And it does start to, and it's, it's actually quite automatic. You do start to think, well, really, is this a profession that I can fit into? If you're anything like me, I started researching the areas of law that I was really interested in, one of which is inquest law. Some of you that know a bit about inquests, you might have heard of the um, Angelina Review that was about death in custody. And it spoke about the racial stereotypes that exist. And it said, um, the stereotyping of young black men as dangerous, violent, and volatile is a long-standing trope that is ingrained in the minds of society. So when you're an aspiring barrister that hopes to persuade judges, that's not the face you want to have, if that makes sense. And that's how you feel people are gonna see you. So in terms of this moment now, this really is a moment where if it's done properly, um, aspiring black entrants into the profession, they can think actually maybe this doesn't have to be such an intimidating, daunting place. They don't have to have the thoughts that we all had. Um, and I think in terms of microaggressions, um, it's actually quite unbelievable. And every time I tell this story, I have to WhatsApp the friend I was with to just check I'm relaying it accurately. Um, but I was at a, a legal training event. So it was, I was currently a BPTC student and it was BPTC students and barristers. Um, and we were all in a group. I was with my black colleague. We were walking into the part of the building where the training was gonna take place. And, um, and I should add, we were part of a, a much wider group of white barristers and white BPTC students. And the people at the door literally swooped in and they shepherded my colleague and I away, all very politely. And they started walking us to a different part. Now, we didn't really realize what was going on because we were already in conversation. So we started getting small talk with the person and we were like, oh, so how's your day? Uh, anyway, where are you taking us? And they went, oh, this event here is for um, barristers and, and BPTC students. And we said, wait, we're barristers and BPTC students. So why have you just walked us half a mile away from where we're meant to be? Um, and I think in that moment, she realized what she'd done. But I can almost laugh at it now because I'm very much over it. And actually I've, I've got a pupillage and I'm, I'm happy with that. But actually those things can completely crush your confidence when you're trying to enter this profession. Any pupil barrister will tell you, you probably think you've done everything wrong anyway. So when these experiences are happening, it just reinforces this perception that maybe you don't quite fit in into this world. So I'm looking forward to hearing from others. Uh, thank you again for having me. Um, and yeah, that's all I'll say for now. Thank you. Thanks so much, Christian. Um, and we will be moving on to the discussion part and um, just let the audience know and the panelists that we hopefully will be closing the event about 8.10, 8.15 ish. But if you do have to leave, then that's absolutely fine. But we just um, didn't want to rush anyone to sort of let you know in advance. But of course, um, if you have to leave, that's absolutely fine. Um, so I'm going to hand it over now to Moni for the second part of the event. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you to um, everyone so much for um, for kind of sharing your kind of experiences, um, reflecting on things that have happened, and and you know, and you've actually made my job a lot easier because you've actually kind of put forward some really really good um, kind of uh, recommendations that can be put forward to next week's event, which I'll um, recap some kind of uh, uh, as many as I can um, at the end. Um, but I just wanted to, well, you've kind of, yeah, you've really helped kind of with the second part of the discussion in terms of how do we kind of, how do you, how do we all kind of use our, the experiences that we've gone through to kind of drive change? And it feels like this year, because race, you know, racism, racist experiences, all these kind of you know, microaggressions, these have been going on for years, clearly, but this year it feels like there's, there's something's changed in, in that people 
there are more people willing to kind of listen, prepared to listen, and not just people within our communities, but but white people, people, you know, the people um, who had the power to to make that change, make those changes a reality. So I just wanted to um, ask because one of the things that was mentioned quite early on was people are, um, you know, it can be exhausting kind of saying all the stuff that's happened and going over kind of, you know, yes, this happened to me and it can be tiring and it takes up a lot of energy. And one thing, you know, it's one thing kind of talking to people who've had similar experiences, but obviously the people who need to hear are the people who haven't had those experiences. And the people who haven't had those experiences are, are likely to be kind of the ones who have the power to, um, to make those changes that are required a reality in terms of improving racial diversity. I just wanted to, I'll just kick off with one, um, one suggestion, but you know, or the panelists feel free to kind of you know take it in any direction but for instance what can chambers and law firms and and the judiciary do, uh, do um what can be done i just wanted to uh, ask what the panelists views were on for instance having conversations within your firms within your chambers with say white colleagues just talking you know having kind of arranging meeting virtual meetings where you share your experiences with, with those people who might not have um, um, uh, a, pro, an, a in depth understanding of the issues that that um, you've faced. And I want, you know, is that something that you think would be a good thing? Having, you know, creating a safe space where you can share your experiences of the racism you've experienced, and they can they can also ask, maybe ask questions that they might feel embarrassed to ask. They're not, you know, they don't, you know, they think, oh, if I ask this, this might come out terribly and I don't mean it to come terribly, but all with the kind of aim of improving, improving their understanding, improving awareness of the issues that you experience. And that then hopefully then kind of, kind of has a ripple effect in terms of, you know, um driving future change in terms of you know just people having more awareness of, of the issues you face. So I just want to see what the panelists think of something like that, for instance. Um, yeah. Sorry, I, yeah, I, I mean I think one of the things I think Abin Bola said before that uh something about being I, I don't know if you use this word uh necessarily but unapologetic in terms of uh the way you come across about things and I think one of the things that, and it was before this year, when we started doing events at Lee Day with the BAME committee, is um, we were very kind of uh, casual in the approach that we took. So it was never formal. It was never about lecturing people. It was always about having discussions um, around these topics. And and I think it is that we, we have some, uh, a good number of people within the firm who are unapologetic about their experiences and are forthright in their experiences in having these discussions. Um, and I think there is that balance, right? It's, it's looking after our own mental health and um, whilst kind of <laughs> doing our day jobs um, and, and, and remembering that our day jobs are not necessarily to be the race advisors to, to, to our white colleagues, um, but at the same time, knowing that um, uh, in order to kind of uh, move forward on these issues, we pr will probably have to do um, more of the teaching um and um i think in events that we've had internally we we've always made sure that they are like more conversational and not necessarily preaching and we've opened up that space and very much encouraged people to uh under chatham house rule to say that okay you can say things in here that and we don't expect anyone to be out outrightly racist of course but we can say things you can say things in here where it is about having the discussion and you're not going to be attacked um, because I'm sure people don't know how to approach um, these things and I do think creating those spaces are important but also having that balance for um, for our black and Asian colleagues and saying <laughs> that we're paid to come here and, and, and do our jobs first and foremost and not necessarily give up all of our time to to educate people uh, about issues of race. Yeah I would say I, I agree with a lot of what Kwame has said I would also say that it really depends on the working environment that you are in. Um, if we're looking at and taking 
if we're looking at the statistics, a lot of people are the only or one of very few ethnic minorities in their work environment, particularly at the bar. And so to say really that you then have this kind of um, not obligation, but, but to then put yourself out there to speak about things which are very personal and which are actually very painful with colleagues that can't at least initially relate necessarily to what you are discussing is a really vulnerable position for you to open yourself up to. And um, I think the one thing that we really need to be conscious of is that although we may be the black colleagues, the Asian colleagues and so on that our white peers have, there is a lot of literature out there already that sets out the experiences of ethnic minorities. There's just a lot of data that is there already as well. And I think a much more interesting question is why are white colleagues um, not proactively seeking that information out? And why are they not reading that and educating themselves? Why is there still this kind of position? I just feel like when it comes to discussions about race, it's really strange the way that people approach it as though it's this kind of like really inaccessible, really specialist topic. Whereas we're lawyers and our job is to research. Our job is to get comfortable with things which are outside of our experiences and to advise people about those areas. And yet when it comes to race, people play dumb and they say that they have to be spoken to about these things. And it's the onus is put back on the people who are experiencing the prejudice. Um, and I just find it, I find it quite tricky. Um, so yeah, I have I have been more open about the things that have happened to me and I have been more open about the, my experiences, but I'm also almost 10 years cool. I'm somebody who's now very comfortable in my set of chambers. I'm somebody who has a wide range of solicitors who would instruct me and know me so that I don't feel as though my practice will necessarily be affected by that. Um, yeah, so I, I would question really whether we're looking at things from the right perspective or we even ask that question in the first place. Could I make a contribution perhaps uh, about that? The truth is, if we don't talk about it, white people are not going to do that research. That's the reality because the default position, think about the structure, the default position is something that advantages and privileges them. So what is the incentive for them to do anything about it and history will teach us that if we want to change things we've got to take proactive steps it is exhausting i agree with what everybody says i've been trying to do it for 30 years in this profession and i'm continually trying to do it in the wake of george floyd's death i was asked to do a ted talk about uh, racism in the criminal justice system i was happy to do that as a result of the talk uh, uh, being produced and disseminated, I received an unbelievable wave of racism from white supremacists, um, alt-right groups, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a cost and it's not easy. But then the question is, if we don't do it, who is going to do it? And I think there are two uh, levels that we need to think about. Because my view is not only is it something that we uh, can do and should do, my view is it's our duty to do this if we want to try to change things. And I think we need to look internally and externally. I think internally, yes, we need to uh, talk to um, our colleagues and the profession. And that's why when I was chair of the Bar Equ uh, Equality and Diversity uh, Training Committee, I did that for a number of years, week after week after week, talking to maybe 2,000, more than 2,000 members of our profession about these issues. But I do think also we need to talk externally because what you see in the legal profession and in the bar, and I'm sure the solicitor's profession is the same, is you see um, a distillation, some of the, the fissures of a racialized system and racialized justice. And we actually have um, a unique insight into how that operates. Now, unless we are prepared to make that known to other people externally, unless we are prepared to talk about it in a courageous way, and as one of our colleagues said, in uh, unabashed, not to be apologetic, but to talk about it in a forthright and clear way with the conviction that we want to change things and what is happening 
is not good enough and it's never been good enough but my experience is that when you start doing that you you do get the backlash and you will get a lot of negative uh, feedback and comments but you will also do something else and since the TED talk for example I've had um, dozens and dozens in fact hundreds of people from all over the world who have contacted me and who have uh, tried to um, connect with themselves with me and with other people and there are a number of cases that have arisen as a result of that and so what you can do your intervention can be a trigger and a spark for positive change it isn't easy but I think we've got a duty to do it Natasha did you want to say something I did um it's really tricky because talking about our experiences of um, racism at the bar or whatever in society um, is actually quite traumatic. Um, I've done this, I've done it before. I've spoken about it before in like platforms because I've reached that stage where I don't really care. I don't personally feel like it's going to affect my career. But I think being um, as I'm still junior, but as senior as I am, I, I'm in that comfortable position to be able to do that. A lot of people aren't in that comfortable position to be able to do that. I think also being at self-employed bar makes it slightly easier. And also being in the chambers, like our chambers, Dexter and Sonali, makes it easier for us to be able to talk about these things because our chambers is very um, open and very um, diverse. A lot of people in other chambers don't necessarily have the um, confidence or capability of speaking about these issues without potentially facing backlash from within. Um, I think also we need to remember we're self-employed, therefore it won't necessarily affect us speaking about these things as negatively as it could be for someone who is employed, for example. It could actually affect their job prospects or, 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 or their, their employment or their uh, promotion prospects where they're working. So I think some of us are in a privileged position to be able to talk about these things. And for those of us that can and have the emotional strength to do so and conviction can do so. But we also need to recognise that there are many people who can't. Absolutely. I, agree. I totally agree. I totally agree. There isn't a one size that fits all for this. But in terms of the principle about whether we should keep talking about this, nothing will change. Nothing is going to change unless we talk about it. And the, the truth is we cannot do it on our own. And that, and again, going back to the anti-apartheid anti movement, what they understood is that you need to form alliances. It's what Angela Davis says, um, ex-Black Power um, uh, activist. And she says, you don't need just a moment, you need a movement. And a movement requires people to forge uh, alliances that you wouldn't otherwise forge. And the way you forge alliances is by talking to people. That's how it works, I think. Yeah, but the cycle Dexter has to end. It can't be that every single set of people that comes up has to re-traumatise themselves by sharing their stories so that people view it as a legitimate experience and then start having the conversations. So we, we can't just say, oh, everyone needs to talk about their experiences. There's a positive duty for people to talk about their experience. Fine, if you have the capacity and if you have the ability to do so, then mm -hmm. you can do so. However, the onus is not on us to fight racism because we didn't create the racism that affects us. The onus is on white people to do what they can to change the system. And I'm not going to use the term ally because I think that that is a kind of con congratulatory title for someone doing what is quite frankly the bare minimum of what they ought to be doing. And my view is that actually, fine, if you're in that position to talk, then certainly talk about it. But why is Dexter describing having to have those conversations for the last 30 years? And then people who are coming up are also describing having to have those conversations as well. We need to think of ways that we can change it so that we don't even need to have those initial conversations to justify the fact that we are discussing racism and we move into tackling racism itself. I'm tired of having to explain and to justify the fact that I feel that something has been racist. We need to actually just get to the conversations about the racism. And if we are still having to have those initial conversations, we're failing because we're still we're saying that the people who are coming up are going to have to repeat that traumatic experience before they can get into it. It upsets me that Christian 
is describing that experience and he's you know more junior than I am because it means that 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 it's continuing the cycle is continuing so I, I really think that moving forward we need to move away from language that puts the onus on people to have conversations and to move out of those spaces and puts the onus on others to proactively learn. And you're very right. Why would, why would white people do so when ultimately it doesn't individually benefit them? But first of all, that is actually a false statement. It benefits them. The system benefits from diversity. The system benefits from moving away from racism. The system benefits from being truly meritocratic. And we need to get to a point where people understand that actually, even as white people tackling racism will ultimately benefit them. It will make society better. It will, it will permeate through to social discrimination and class discrimination as well. So there are still white people who will benefit from anti-racism. So all of, that needs, all of that needs to change, all of that needs to change. And if we concentrate on actually moving that forward, we'll break the cycle. Well, I, I agree. I mean, I agree with that. I mean, it, what I said was that, look, white, white people don't perceive that this is going to benefit them. That's the point. They, they think, what is in this for me? Why do I have to do this? And history tells us that where there are those ideations, people will do nothing. And that's the history of the last 30 years. And so somehow we have to enlist them because otherwise it's not going to happen. It just isn't going to happen. I wish it would. If there was a way to do it that is more effective, someone please tell me what it is. I don't Can think I... there is. I just don't think there is. That ha there is. Did you want to? Did you want to say something? I just wanted to say something. It's just in response to Natasha as well as Dexter, which is that we try. We're talking about a progressive mo role mo model that we've got in chambers, but I don't want to be complacent about that. Yeah. You know, it is a. It is a good place to be, Garden Court Chambers, but there's. It's, there's, of course, there are imperfections and huge room for improvement, as with any, you know, societal model. So I just want to say that, you know, we are, we've we've been progressive, you know, for the last 30 or so years. But that's um, but Chambers has changed a lot in that time. And we need to and it is diverse, but we need to make sure that we don't just sit in our laurels. We, we want to be improve access to the bar. We want to proactively do to take steps. And that is. As th those are things that actually are initiated by both white and black people in chambers and that's maybe the difference of our particular experience in in the group that we're in the chambers that we're in but i do think that we need i, I would never want us to, to think that you know we've somehow we've, we're okay and we've, we've done cracked it. it we haven't cracked it <laughs> we have, we have <laughs> research shows we haven't cracked it and i think i think that's true we need to have humility about it but what, i think we are lucky to operate in in that kind of uh, context, I agree with that. But so I just have to be having those conversations um, because I, I think Dexter makes a good point. Those you, we still need to have those conversations. It, it is exhausting and it takes up a lot of energy and um, and and it is it can be re-traumatic as well. Reliving those experiences. What are people's thoughts? And Ali mentioned it on. I don't know how widespread it is, and I, I've certainly heard about it mentioned from the gender equality perspective. But reverse mentoring in terms of is there kind of is that quite is that actually the a good way an effective way where, for instance, younger members of the profession can then um, speak to so not a wide group of people but just one individual who can kind of you know support them and they might be in a position where they can kind of um uh help natasha i'm just gonna just stick my head into this one quickly because i was speaking to the um bsb about their reverse mentoring scheme on monday um i don't like the idea of um reverse mentoring as it stands as it currently stands um partly because as abby has rightly said before it puts the onus on, and in this case, um, for the BSB scheme, it puts the onus on black people to teach white people not to be racist. That's not our job. I'm sorry, I'm tired. It's not my job. One. Two, with that particular scheme, and I've said it to them, to their faces twice, so I can say it here too, um, they were looking particularly at BPTC students and pupil barristers. Who I said to them are the most vulnerable people in or coming to the bar. 
how do you expect with that power dynamic being so off any true comfort within that relationship for people to actually be able to to work with each other to create some sort of change there's a third element as well which is if a barrister has come into these sorts of schemes and said, hey, I really want to participate in this. I want to become anti-racist. I wouldn't necessarily say to go as far as to say you're preaching to the choir because you're not preaching to the choir. There's something that we can all learn. There are things that I can learn too. But you're not really fully reaching out to the people that we really need to, to deal with. You know, the judges who say the most inappropriate things to me or about me in court in front of my clients. We're not reaching out to the court staff that are assuming that we're defendants. We're not reaching out to, to the people who are really like creating a horror for our, our day to day life. So I don't really like the idea of reverse mentoring for all of those reasons. So do you think then in which case, um, is there, I think um, having made the point with, um, with what well, we were talking about anti-racism training, but how it should be actually inherent at kind of all levels so it's not like an add-on it's it's you see at every single level so it becomes so that you know that kind of anti-racist consciousness becomes ingrained um in the way we work um do any of the panelists kind of have any kind of views on on for instance kind of examples that they could kind of any suggestions for what that might look like kind of what elements of the process for instance that could be introduced in like absolutely definitely you know immediately Um, in terms of um, anti-racism training, um, I'm, I'm not really sure. Again, I, I, I think I agree with what the, the others have said about it puts the onus on, on black people somewhat. I think the only way, look, there was, I can't remember what president it was. It might have been the, the guy after Roosevelt, excuse my American history is not the greatest, but when it was civil rights, could have been Eisenhower and in the 50s. And he said, you cannot legislate um, in what's in someone's heart and we can do all of this anti-racism we can educate people but we have to understand the society we live in the, what the default position is how people are grown up even if we're having these conversations with people at the bar or in court or whatever think of when they're going back to their rural areas in Kent or Essex when they're around their mates it all it all falls apart uh, I think going forward we need to concentrate on ourselves and, and you know it's black history month black excellence yeah the first thing we need to do is to show people that we are competent professionals in everything we're, we're, we're doing I, I think it, i'm not saying that it's like flogging a dead horse with this kind of um anti-racism approach but how much of these people are really going to be taken seriously? Look at pupillage committees, for example. Now, as much as I know 25s and Garden Court, I'm sure you've got some new black pupils, but I've been doing the mag circuit for the last five months now, every single day. As much as I see loads of black solicitors, as I've said, do you know, I see a load of pupil barristers and guess what? I've only seen two, and I made a point of counting them, two black pupil barristers. Every single one of them, they look the same, they sound the same. So who's on these pupillage committees? And then again, we're looking at the bench. Who, where does the bench, whether it's district judges or we go up to the Crown Court, where does the bench, where do they recruit from for judges? It's mostly from the bar. It's that the bottom of the, pro the profession is the problem, the top of the profession is the problem, and the people in the middle. And so we're missing the mark. And, it, and so I would say, and I'm not plugging no one's book or anything, but there is one particular book I've been reading at the moment that sums up a lot of today. I'm going to... Any of you guys read this? I'm reading it, actually. Yeah, and, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it kind of sums up a, a lot of things. And... I think we need a lot of things need to be challenged now. It, I think the first thing to do, example, and you guys, I'm sure you've sat in your pupilish committees, some of you, we need to start um, blowing out names off of pupilage applications because as soon as they see someone with a non-English name, that's an automatic bias. I mean, look, me, I'm Mark Robinson. You, you think I'm some um, guy from wherever East London, a white guy, yeah? And I've got this name through dinner of slavery. My people, my ancestors were slaves. I'm putting that it's straight you know what I mean there's no nice way to put that out, out there again um just like the university bus take off the names 
off of pupillage applications and, and, and also in terms of um, solicitor firms as well and take off your university that you went to that gives someone uh, um, if you really want to be meritocracy um, a meritocracy then i think that is the starting point no names no universities and you judge someone for what they've done what's on their cv their academic grades and that that kind of all the sifting process that would eliminate bias and i think those people that are on these pupilage committees or the recruitment committees that if you need to do any sort of anti-racism training those people that sit in those panels need to go through rigorous anti-racism um, um, training before they even get to sit on any of those panels. Yeah, that's um, my um, point there. Can I say? Um, oh, I, so I'm going to carry on uh, just for a few few more minutes because obviously this is a really good discussion. So I'll let Hassa interrupt when we have to properly cut off. But yeah, Lauren, go ahead. So um, I echo exactly what Mark's saying. So I've been to, but it was interesting actually, and I made a mental note of it one time I went to um, Bromley Magistrates Court. I was representing a, a black defendant. The probation officer was black. The court clerk was black. The prosecutor was black. Three white magistrates. And, and that is exactly the problem that we're talking about. Magistrates, district judges. I've done a lot of circuits on the district um, in the magistrates court. And I believe I've only come across one black district judge, one black male district judge. From my own perspective in my firm, there's uh, 15 of us in my firm. We are, with the exception of one trainee who is white, we are all black and Asian in my firm. And I am quite unap unapologetic about it because I am in a position whereby I can offer employment, work experience, and any other experience that I can possibly give to people who won't get it by virtue of their name on an application form. I didn't go to Oxford or Cambridge. I went to Thames Valley University, which used to be a polytechnic. I was, uh, my mother was a single parent and I am a single parent. So in order for me to give back and for me to enable, enable other people the opportunities that they, that they deserve, that is something that I do. In a year alone, my firm, I, I am um, shortlisted in the upcoming um, uh, event of, uh, uh, I'm law, nominated as the law firm leader of the year. My colleague was nominated as legal aid lawyer of, of the year. She was actually a finalist. I have another colleague in my office who was the pro bono shortlisted for the pro bono lawyer of the year. And that is within my firm within one year. So those are the opportunities that we have to give. We have to make opportunities for ourselves. And I, I completely agree. I don't have the time or the inclination to educate other people about my race. What I will do is educate and empower my people about our race. Thanks so much. Could I just go to Sonali? Um, I, know she's I was waving my head. I mean, one of the things, just coming back to something that Mark said a couple of um, moments ago, but before his last contribution, was just about access to the bar or how we need to widen access to the bar. And just talking about a practical example, having told you about my terrible introduction to Middle Temple, I'm now, you know, I've, I've now been a, made a bencher of Middle Temple. And one of the things I'm doing, along with Middle Temple themselves, they are putting money into a scheme and they do put money into a scheme called access to the bar. It's a, you apply, the people who, and people like me sit on the committee as to determine who should get the awards. Those awards go to people who wouldn't necessarily otherwise have any experience of the bar. We don't, it's not judged on how many, you know, what your degree result is. It's about based on how we can assess potential. You get a, pay, a paid, expenses paid, um, a, ability to marshal with a judge. It's like a mini pupillage. It's a four week program. So that is a concrete example of the sort of thing that is being paid for by the inn, or at least by Middle Temple. Um, to try to increase access. It's not perfect, it's not going to solve all the problems, but that, and the Garden Court to have a similar sort of initiative in terms of trying to, it, it getting a sponsoring um, a young person who's coming from school, thinking about wanting to go into the legal profession. You've got to get people early because all the disadvantages just pile up and pile up and become almost insurmountable. 
And that's why these, these, that kind of scheme, and I know there's been many schemes and many criticisms, but at least it's some piece of positive action. That's all I wanted to say. I'm sorry. I sorry, so I'm... just... Hang on. So, so just... Let's get to um, responding to Sonali. So that this is good, the access to the bar. However, uh, with all these different chambers that are doing these schemes, how many of people are actually getting a pupillage at the end of it? At the end of the day, uh, 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 garden court aside, because I know how they, they run, yeah, you, um, another chambers could have all this great access to the bar, have mock trials in a secondary school. All it takes, yeah, and any of you can correct me if I'm lying, yeah, is someone with Oxbridge on the application and they will get that pupillage. And I've seen nothing at all to convince me anything otherwise. Natasha? Jump in quickly. Um, because I also sit on the Bar Council um, and I also sit on the Race Working Group, which is um, a working group of the Bar Council. Um, I've heard a lot of different um, types of recruitment that um, Chambers can use and can be adopting. Of course, there is blind recruitment, which is one thing, and luckily the pupillage gateway allows, I think it has an option where you can basically make the applications blind. Although there is some concern that um, you can't really use contextual recruitment with that. So, for example, there may be some people who do not have, um, who did not get good grades at a certain point in their academic career. And um, you can't necessarily use aspects of their background because those have been omitted. To be able to say, you know, actually, you might bump them up on points because, you know, they kind of deserve a bit of a leg up compared to, you know, public school, Oxbridge, um, BCL here kind of thing. Um, there are some, there was an article in Council Magazine a while ago about um, using a blend of the two. So using um, blind recruitment at one point and then also using contextual recruitment. There's also opportunities to use organizations which apparently are quite expensive, like rare recruitment, I think it's called, um, where I know Chambers has used them before, where they basically flagged, and somehow they flagged an applicant or they had them come and do a mini they have an algorithm. They have an algorithm. So yeah. they understand the contextual background of the institutions that various people have gone to. And they can basically put it into an algorithm so that you 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 spot the diamonds in the rough, basically. Yeah, as a result, I think, I think yeah, that you reminded me. They actually like they're able to pick out the people who did the highest, for example, in their school. So you, there could be a school that was you know, I don't know, twenty percent of people get A stars for C in their GCSEs, for example. Um, and they can pick out the people who actually, you know, got the highest marks in that school to be like, actually, they did really well for that school and they can flag them up for um, chambers and other organisations that recruit using their recruitment. Now, apparently there was one chambers that I think they actually recruited a pupil, I think, using their recruitment. And they were like, if we'd seen this person's application form, they wouldn't even got to interview stage. So those are the sorts of um, things that the bar can be using, but they are very expensive. Um, so I can imagine there not being as much uptake, particularly in the publicly funded areas of the bar than the other side. Although I think the other side, in terms of the commercial end, um, they kind of need to do that a lot more than <laughs> the other end because there's hardly any bar barristers in, in, in the commercial end and that's really problematic. Yeah, can I just say about that? I think that's a really good point. Can I say about that? The, the deep paradox of the position, and so is that in terms of the in-house training that I did with Chambers, most of the Chambers who specifically asked me to go and uh, train them internally were the big heavy hitting commercial sets. And the reason they, want, they did that, it wasn't just because they had this uh, great moral revelation, it was because they need to do it, it's self-serving to some extent, that if they want to get uh, uh, work from Google or YouTube or Facebook or whoever it is, they need to have a much better um, diversity profile. So, you know, the question is, when something is that um, instrumental and strategic, is it bad or good? To, to some extent, I don't care what I want is a better representation of minority ethnic lawyers in the profession and it will change you know that the concept is what we need to do i agree with what someone said much earlier what we need to do is to have much greater visibility we need to flood the zone and that will make a difference i'll never forget what the first ever case where i sat as a judge 
in the Crown Court was a uh, defendant was a young black uh, um, defendant in South London who'd be beaten up by the police, had drugs planted on him, etc., etc. And just the, the jury acquitted about three minutes. It's kind of throwback to the 80s kind of case. And I'll never forget when they were leaving court after the acquittal, the grandfather of the defendant stood at the door of the court and then just uh, bowed to me. And I said, what were you, why are you doing that? And he said, look, for three generations, the third generation of my family have come in front of this court. It's the first time that anybody has ever treated a member of my family with respect. And he said, thank you for that. And it's really important. It's really important. You know, Garden Court, we've had for a long time um, a policy, a sort of unwritten policy about whether or not people should sit or uh, go to the bench. And there was a real, there was a real political, a, a genuine political debate about that. And I've got to say, for a long time, I, I wasn't sure, but it was one of the best things I've ever done. And I wish I had done it earlier. I would strongly recommend that everybody who's interested in social justice in our profession thinks seriously about sitting um, in various capacities judicially. It makes an enormous difference, particularly actually at the lower end, because those are the cases where they're marginal cause. If you're sitting in, you know, I sometimes sit at the Old Bailey, you're sentencing people to 13 years, 27 years. But when you're doing other cases lower down, you can make a massive difference to whether someone goes to prison or not, the course of their life. And you, I, I strongly recommend people uh, think about uh, applying for judicial roles and trying to find judicial mentors. We've talked about reverse mentoring. One of the most important things I think that can happen is that people from minority ethnic backgrounds should look to people who are already sitting who can help them. And I think that is going to be a massive thing in terms of changing some of the outcomes people are talking about. Just uh, conscious of time. Abby, do you want to quickly make your point and then we'll start to wrap it up? Yeah, it's just a super short point because I don't think we're naturally going to get to it. But there was something that Mark said earlier that I wanted to um, talk about very quickly. Um, and that is the points that he was making around the fact that we see in a lot of high street firms, we see a lot of black ownership and firms like Lauren's, like MTC, are thriving because they're very switched on. Um, you know, the fact that Lauren, I, I don't think she'll... Um, be annoyed at me for saying this but the fact that Lauren's team have received so many awards is because they are proactive about promotion and about holding these kind of ceremonies to account and making sure that they are included they push for that space and it's rewarded because they have quality and they you know deserve that space but I think obviously we are speaking in the context of young legal aid lawyers groups but we also need to remember that there is an issue, even in crime, for example, about where ethnic minorities practice. A lot of them are in the publicly funded areas. When you start to look at the private work, the white collar work, the six figure incomes, that's not the black practitioners, it's not the Asian practitioners. And you don't see a lot of black and Asian solicitors in those big firms with the big money training contracts and the career progression and the equity partnerships and so on. So I think we also need to not get too comfortable and think that one side of the profession is necessarily better than the other or that one area is necessarily better than the other because what you actually see consistently is that in every area we see the concentration of ethnic minority representation in the poorer paid sections and that's why when the bar council did their surveys they found that people from black backgrounds in particular who are practitioners were most likely to be financially hit by covid because of the court closures and because that's where they made their bread and butter and they didn't have as much advisory and paperwork as others so that's another aspect for us to turn our minds to in terms of um what we do where how where we encourage people to go where we how we encourage people to diversify their practices as they move up the writing and the opportunities of exposure of academic exposure um that people from black backgrounds in particular are provided with i'll just quickly um just to start wrapping things up before i hand over to hafsa i'll just highlight just some of the points that were there's been so much that's been discussed during what's been i think a really helpful and informative and insightful um, event. I just, these are some things that I jotted down. Um, 
while our younger generation, um, what what are they anxious about? What's worrying them? Those are questions which it'll be good to you know we we put that out there and be good even if they tweet you know uh, what what is what are you anxious about? What are you worried about? To tweet and tell 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 all of us what that is so we can put that to to the people just you know move the conversation forward and go this is what they're worried about. Um, Anti-racism training. Um, there was, um, I think it was Abby mentioned about you know making it um, kind of you know not an add-on, but having it kind of inherent in every part of the system. But I think Mark, you mentioned also the point of those people who are in charge of you know recruitment and pupillage application, making sure they're you know basically they're not racist. You know, you know nailing it with with those people, those people who make the the key decisions. Uh, there was um, also the the idea of scholarships. So. Uh, chambers and firms you know especially with covid that they're under kind of quite considerable financial constraints so kind of moving the onus on to say for instance as mark pointed out ins um and 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 kind of you know possibly barristers and solicitors contributing towards a fund uh towards scholarships maybe apprenticeships where to improve the social mobility of people coming in um just to have more diversity. There was, um, I think Anila mentioned this, kind of just the need for more nuanced conversations, uh, which I think is really important. There's so many sub elements to, to everything that actually we need to kind of have, you know, it might require lots of conversations, but really honing in on specific issue and, and drilling down rather than trying to cover so many, so many things. Um, there's also, uh, what else I've got? Oh, I think, yep, yeah. work allocation, um, who we push to be ranked. And also I'd say uh, from my perspective as at the Law Society Gazette, I do things like My Legal Life and Law in the News and I get a lot of emails of people being um, um, proposed to feature. And I have to say, it's not many um, people from BAME backgrounds. It tends to be, you know, a large chunk of the people who are who are suggested to me often tend to be to be white people and it would be good to see kind of more um black and asian people and minority ethnic backgrounds being kind of promoted and pushed and suggested and kind of encouraged to to um to you know just to be kind of not put this phrasing it badly but just kind of you know suggest them when you're for instance pitching to me not another elderly white solicitor um, who's a man uh, so yeah um, and also accountability uh, allyship I know that's uh, I think uh, yeah I know some panelists kind of didn't like the phrase allyship but how to be an effective ally and um, and I thought it was a really good one about it was referred to pupil pupillage applications I know I think the CPS does this but kind of blind CVs in a sense because I imagine I know for a fact with my name um, name a name can be a barrier to how far you progress um if someone can't say your name or just think how the hell you know you're probably denied lots of opportunities you don't even re realize just because someone can't say your name um and just doesn't want to deal with that hassle so yeah those are just there's loads more uh points which i haven't covered but just wanted to kind of highlight some of the stuff that's been raised and have so i'll hand over to you well, thank you so much to each of the fantastic panelists for taking part and for staying um, later as well um, in this really important and timely discussion. There's so much to think about um, and really I'm hopeful and optimistic that organisations such as the CBA and HMCTS will be willing and receptive to receive recommendations that the profession has and next week's while event will be doing just that and taking the plans forward and hopefully um, further some of the conversations and uh, the really amazing points that we've raised today in terms of um, going forward. Um, so we'll definitely keep everyone uh, posted on those and check out the social media for um, what we're doing with the next steps um, and kind of develop a new conversations. So thank you so much again. Um, we're going to close the event here and hope you all enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you so much. Take care. Thanks.